My name is Sean Krobler and welcome to September Small Business Month. Today's show, we're talking about hiring and keeping the best staff. How do you do that and how is it best done? Because we all know that staff are very important when it comes to running a business. Now, thankfully today, I've been joined by um, Anna-Marie Rook. Welcome to the show, Anna-Marie. Hi, Sean. How are you? Very good, thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. It's fantastic to have you involved. Um, You're very now, welcome. Anna-Marie is a resource strategy consultant with strong leadership and profitable outcomes through effective people talent strategies. And that's why she's joining us here today. She's a recruitment strategist helping companies create greater sophistication in their recruitment strategy and talent branding strategy. Now, Anna-Marie, before we jump into sharing lots of great quality content with our viewers today, I thought we'd just quickly chat about how you work with companies um, to achieve capital excellence at Corporate Canary HR Consulting, the company you've created. Sure, uh, absolutely. Well, I've been working with companies, small to uh, start-up companies really for the last 18 years, uh, developing their foundation for their, their HR, which I call their HR life cycle. So how Corporate Canary helps various clients, it, it really depends on what stage or what area of their HR life cycle that they are, are facing. Uh, in their in where they they are in their growth of their organisation. Uh, so, firstly, you know, I, I would look at the organisation's uh, current uh, status in terms of their HR structure and uh, strategy and foundation, and look at areas where we can improve. Um, quite often, uh, clients come to me with an idea about where they think they need to be uh, building and developing out their HR strategy, uh, but when we have a look at it, uh, it can often uh, be in a different area to what the owner or the executive team think it actually is. And a lot of the times, the employees can actually drive that uh, because they're feeling most of the pain in the organisation. So you know, I help organisations uh, with their recruitment strategy uh, in terms of looking at um, you know, what's working for them, what they're not utilising and, and quite often uh, many organisations are very, very underutilising uh, what's out there in, in, the, um, in the recruitment world. So uh, I guess a lot of people can sometimes confuse um, HR consulting or corporate canary with a recruiter. Uh, a recruiter is actually just, just one small slice of the whole recruitment strategy. So. Uh, I help uh, organisations expand that uh, so they're maximising um, what they need to in the area of recruitment. And performance management and leadership development, I do coaching, uh, work with uh, executive teams, coaching them, um, the, the whole HR life cycle really. Yeah. That's great. I mean, okay, so for a, a startup or a small business that you might be working for, what is really the first step in defining that strategy? Is it defining the recruitment, who you're going to recruit or is it understanding the organisation as a whole? What are the first steps for you? Yeah, well as I said once again it depends on the stage of that startup or where they are and, and, and what their products are. Every organisation is, is different. Uh, so first of all we look at you know what their business plan is, what their growth strategy is. Now some uh, organisations or companies may uh, be looking at expanding um, in terms of their geography and reach across different regions. Uh, other organisations might be looking at um, expanding their product line or, their, or, or, or they might be looking at um, going into adding on services as well as their products. So each one of those uh, strategies requires a, a different approach uh, in a recruitment. So the key is really to lay the, uh, the foundations, be really prepared um, for the, the workforce and the skills and, and knowledge that you, ne you need. Um, so, so we're looking across the organisation and, and what kind of roles are needed. One, one of the biggest mistakes that I see uh, particularly small organisations and startups do uh, and, and it's a trap that many fall into and it's a very practical and logical step that an organisation or small company would, would do in their growth 
is that they will take uh, two roles and they'll smash them together into one role and they'll go, right, well, we need somebody who, who's, say, for example, going to be um, doing sales um, but we also need them to do customer service as well because we're, not, we're just not quite big enough yet to have one full role of each. Um, and what they actually do in doing that, they, they're unwittingly putting to get together two um, uh, different sets of um, behaviours that are required within the role. Uh, and you know they're they're looking for an, an animal that doesn't actually really exist out there. I call it the um, the push me pull you effect. You know, remember the uh, Doctor Doolittle, and he was uh, in search of this myth, uh, mythical character called the push me pull you. Well, that's what a lot of organisations tend to do out there. Is um, you know they they make it create a, a wish list. Um, of, of what they want and don't actually realise that it, on, on the behavioural side um, when, of recruitment, it's, it's vitally, vitally important to get the right behaviours in the role. Uh, so I help organisations with determining um, what uh, behavioural profiles are going to actually work for that role or whether they're looking for some mythical creature like the push me pull you that just doesn't exist out there. Because what they're actually doing, Sean, is they're, uh, they're uh, unwittingly setting up that employee to fail. Oh, yeah, well. I, I, I can really imagine that, Anne-Marie, because it's, it's basically this, this salesperson and the customer service are two different people and uh, uh, they certainly can't do both roles. So just, just, once, just getting into that whole recruitment thing, for a business out there, what should the, co the, the, the company be doing um, before they start recruiting a company, not only just finding they needed to find the role, you know, yeah. where they're going to post the ad. What is the strategy so, about starting their recruitment process? Yeah, so they, they need to really understand the role first, okay, and not just from the skills, uh, education and experience perspective. That That's the easy part of figuring out the role. Um, the second one, as I mentioned, is, is to really understand the behaviours uh, and, and the temperament that are required. So there's various different tools out there that you can use to help you do that. Um, from that, you then once you understand the, the behaviour and the temperaments required in the role, you are then able to uh, you, you able to draw out the language uh, that uh, that is going to attract the, the kind of people that you want, and then you create your job posting or your your marketing marketing campaign around that role. Um, based on the behaviours because you want to attract the right people to the role and repel the ones that aren't going to be turned on by that language or turned on by what that role content is. Um, then you need to be looking at the various different sources of finding candidates. Uh, now there are studies out there that have shown that the average employer only uses three um, Avenues of sourcing candidates, and typically they will be um, they'll use Seek or a recruiter uh, or a like referral system, like internal referral or internal promotion or, or referral from their employees. Whereas uh, the studies show that candidates themselves actually will use between five to seven ways of actually finding an employer. And those employers who, you know, get the cream of the crop, don't have a problem getting really great employees, um, they will use anywhere from 10 plus various different avenues of sourcing candidates. So it's really important to be um, expanding uh, your, your sources of finding candidates. And um, I find that employers typically are running on a, a, an old outdated mindset around recruitment where it really has significantly changed and you, you, you do unfortunately for the smaller companies, smaller business, need to put a lot of time and energy and effort particularly because there's so much social media that um, really powerfully uh, allows you to open up a, a, a two-way relationship with candidates that you've never been able to do in the past. Uh, so, you know, there's pros and cons of that, uh, but I think the pros are much, much better for the smaller business. Um, 
so it, they it's didn't. Interesting so you mentioned that. Sorry, Anna Marie, it's interesting you mentioned that about the the not using in the right mediums or not using social media. Are there other reasons why small business are not attracting the right people into the workforce? Because I, I hear a lot of small business going, I can't find the right people. Um, yeah. Is that purely just based on the mediums they're using in social media or are there numerous other reasons for that? Um, I'll, I'll take you through the factors for, for that and you might not like what I have to say. Um, it, look, that is a, such a common, common comment and sentiment. We can't find good people, and it's not just small businesses that are saying it; it's large businesses as well. Um, okay, so the one of them is that push me, pull you effect. Um, they're looking for an animal that doesn't exist. Okay, because what they actually do is they're looking for. Um, behaviors that are actually diametrically opposed to each other. So, you know, so first, first thing, understand what behavior, what profiles are out there in the general population and how they're going to fit into your role. Um, <clears throat> discrimination is still a huge factor out there. It's alive and well and kicking, unfortunately. We're, we're going from age discrimination to gender discrimination to, you know, racial discrimination. Um, a, a couple of years ago during the GFC, um, I was part of a um, volunteer outreach group where we, were t we took uh, over 100 um, candidates who were finding it very difficult to find jobs uh, and they were all very skilled um, candidates uh, but they came from various different backgrounds and you know, they experienced such discrimination. It was really, really disheartening. Um, so, you know, have a look at where, as an employer, you may be um, shooting yourself in the foot. Um, there's also, you know, sometimes employers will seek to have uh, qualifications that, you know, when you, re when you really challenge them about it, why is that? Is, is, they re is it really necessary for them to have that qualification or is the experience that they have you know, transferable? Um, they can cull out a lot of people. So you know, when you say you can't find good people, look at the reasons why you're screening out people right, rather than being inclusive. So that's, uh, that's one area. The second area, as I mentioned before, is can't find good people because they haven't broadened their recruitment sources. So um, they haven't looked broad enough um, and, and using uh, various different multiple ways to, to find candidates out there. Also, um, looking at if you are pitching your um, job advertisement or your job posting to the right generation. It depends on, you know, you know if, if you want a certain type of um, individual in that role in the organisation, um, make sure that you're crafting that to targeting the right generation who are attracted by various certain things. You know, Gen, Gen Y are attracted to different benefits um, and, and different things than Gen X and then, then the baby boomers as well. So you need to look at um, how you are uh, pitching that marketing campaign or that job, job post to to right um, bodies of people out there. Yeah. Very good. I just want to touch base quickly on the on the fact of we spoke quite a bit about the broader platforms that people are missing out in in terms of not getting to the wide enough audience. What are some of the biggest platforms people are not using and should be using as a business owner to connect with the right audience? Yeah, look, it, it will really depend once again on the organisation and on the role. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it, you, you could, there's social media platforms um, and then there's other ones that are, that are not, they're offline. So it might be looking into educational institutions um, and, you know, they've got very good career um, uh, um, career drives uh, and avenues for students to, to come through up through their those educational institutions. Uh, there are, there's also various different, they're not job boards uh, but that they, they are, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a, a website called um, Glassdoor. 
Uh, yeah. There's a lot, yeah. So Glassdoor is one where one avenue where you can, where candidates are looking to review companies. Uh, so if you build a profile on these, and there's multiple, various different ones. So if you build a profile on these, uh, and you can attract candidates uh, that way as well. Yeah. Great. Now, you know, once you found found the guess uh, the right people hopefully to recruit. I want to talk a little bit about um, keeping those people long term because obviously the recruitment processes can be expensive, it can be tiring, it can be exhausting finding the right people. How do we make sure when, we, when hiring the right people we put in place structures or uh, contracts that ensure that they stay long term and then secondly while they're employed with you how do we make sure that they become a uh, a loving employee that wants to stay there long term. Okay, all right. Well, the the, the first key is is to get the right person in the first place. Okay, um, InSync surveys have actually done a study over the last since two thousand and ten um, uh, over the last three years, and they've surveyed um, over four hundred uh, small to medium sized organisations. On uh, examining what their their turnover, the causes of their turnover, and why they were not retaining um, their staff, and what they found were there were twelve key uh, causes of turnover, um, and and you know t four of those uh, were outside of the uh, employer or business owners. Um, Control. Okay, so they were things like the economy, um, what the com competition is doing is outside of their control, um, technology uh, and how that impacts and changes some jobs and companies is outside of their control, and also the the demographics to a degree um, of the pool of candidates available to an organisation is can be sometimes largely outside their control, depending on whether they're going to shift their location, which I know I've had clients actually do move from Australia to. Uh, uh, America, because you know that they wanted to increase their demographic pool and take control over that. It's a radical move, but they weighed it up, and it was worth their while to do that. Um, but the other causes for turnover, uh, eighty percent of them are within the company or the business owner's control. Uh, so it's actually getting control over those uh, areas. Uh, to ensure that you're going to retain uh, your your candidates. So those areas are uh, areas such as um, uh, management, for start. Poor management is the one of the largest reasons that candidates move on. Uh, so you can definitely uh, you know upskill your management. We know through studies that. Uh, over 63% of managers actually are never formally trained in being managers. Okay, so they're thrown into the management seat, and they're expected to know how to be a manager. Uh, so you know, it's it, companies really need to be spending time on their leadership to develop really good, strong um, management. Um, other areas are the job characteristics of the role itself. Uh, so that's why it's really key to understand the behaviours. Uh, not all jobs can be exciting. You know, there are just those really mundane jobs, right? Um, and that's why it's important to understand the behaviours of an individual. You're looking for an individual who's going to actually uh, a fairly relaxed and compliant individual who's going to not uh, who, who's going to fit into that role rather than putting someone who's really driven and independent. They're just not going to uh, suit a mundane role. So it's really key in getting those behaviours. So you're keeping the right person there. Some jobs are just thoroughfare jobs. Um, managers and business owners need to accept that there, there are just jobs that are thoroughfare jobs that, you know, many individuals, you know, it, it, as, as, a, as a young adult don't ever dream to go in and have a long-term career in some of these more mundane menial jobs. You know, that might be an area that um, an organisation might choose to outsource. Uh, rather than you know put all the energy, effort, and time and funds into maintaining a permanent employee, uh, because it just is a thoroughfare job. Um, other areas uh, 
is through uh, the benefits that uh, are available and offered to uh, to staff. Now, one of the advantages that small businesses have over the larger businesses is that uh, they've got that flexibility and ability to make decisions and, and create uh, individualised benefits. Largely organisations and larger organisations that have blanket policies um, that cover you know, all organisations, all employees, so it's like seen to be fair. Um, but the fact is we're all individuals, we're all attracted by different things. Typically same with the generations as I mentioned before, the generations are after uh, different things which is becoming quite interesting now because for the first time in, in, in you know, hundreds of years, we have three generations within the workforce at the one time that have real extremes of difference between them and what they're looking for. So the Gen Ys, these studies have shown us that the Gen Ys are looking for, um, then the number one thing they're looking for is their career development and the ability to develop um, their career quickly. Um, you know, because they've been told since they've been at school, you know, your world's your oyster, you know, in, in America you're awesome, you can do anything. Uh, so their expectation is they have a full-blown expectation to, to, to be, ha have a, a career path laid out for them, okay. And Rui, just, uh, just quickly, what, what is Gen Y? Just to find that quickly. Yeah, Gen Y's are from 1980. Um, so the, the Gen Ys now are starting to, they're starting to hit, the older Gen Ys are now starting to hit their 30s. So they're starting to hit that childbearing stage. Um, so they're into strong career development and, and promotion and flexibility. They want um, a large amount of flexibility now. And then comes cash. Um, then comes, you know, salary is important for them. So they're, they're the top three. Whereas with Gen X, um, they're, they're pretty much, they've, they've developed their career, most of them are, you know, right in the middle or in the thick of their career. Um, salary is still king for them um, and flexibility. So they're also um, in the middle of parenthood, teenagehood, uh, and they're looking for flexibility. So salary, flexibility, um, and then they're looking for flexible benefits, so they want a broader range of benefits available to them. Baby boomers, they're still looking, their number one is security, okay, they're in the last of their um, employment years, um, they want to get, um, you know, they want to keep, keep um, employment stable for themselves and then comes salary for them because they want to uh, as much salary as possible to bump up their super, okay, so they're looking down the barrel of retirement coming along. So each of those generations are, are, are looking for different things and smaller companies have the advantage of being able to go, all right, well, we're going to have an open discussion and we're going to say, well, if you, you know, you want to have, Gen Ys want to have this, that's going to work for you and if Gen, you know, Ys, uh, Gen Ys need something else, well, then we're going to have to look at that for, for you as well. Sorry, my phone's going off in the background there. That's all good. Um, yeah. It's a nice tune. So that's good. Should have switched. Should have switched that off. It's all good. It's all good. Okay. So, so baby boomers, and 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 now I guess we've got this interesting mix of people coming through with um. The new, what they call Millennium Kids, the new, the new generation of high tech, technology oriented, social media, fast yeah. moving generation of kids, and how to deal with them as well. Yeah, well, they're just starting to hit the workforce in the in the next couple of years. Um, so they're they're um, <laughs> very distracting. <laughs> Sorry about that. So they're um, not quite in the workforce yet, but they uh, have the expectation of um, a, a real extreme of flexibility uh, and being able to uh, move around. They, they want to be mobile and even now with the younger genera generation wise, um, BYOD is a, a really um, large thing that's 
becoming a bigger and bigger issue, and that's bring your own device. Okay. Um, and you know, I help organisations with creating their bring your own device uh, policies because, you know, they they are quite tricky because you know what's happening, Sean. Really, is that you know the workforce and technology is moving so fast that our um, employment legislation just is not keeping up to, to date with it. Um, it, it. It really is sort of uh, behind the eight ball in terms of all the different things that are coming into play in organisations. Say, for example, like LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn, you know, is is essentially a database, and if you you know work really uh, and build that data black base, it becomes a very valuable entity for that individual. But you know now we're crossing the line of well, you know if you've created that database as a point, you know as a part of your employment with an organisation, who actually owns that? Um, who actually owns those contacts and owns that database? Uh, now that's really important as a retention issue too, uh, because one of the things that many organisations don't factor into the value of an employee walking out their door is the actual value of their con their, their contacts. Um, there is a, an organisation out there that has now developed this really fantastic software that um, actually tracks. Um, the networks within an organisation and without the organisation and actually puts a price price tag, a, a value on those contacts. And we're talking tens of thousands of dollars, you know, eighty to a hundred thousand dollars in value per individual um, within your organisation. Um, so they're wow. the kind of things that you need to uh, Factor in and cost out when you are looking at an employee leaving the organisation. I did a um, a um, calculation, a case study with an organisation who uh, made that mistake of smashing two two roles into one. And when we looked at uh, how much it had actually cost them to have that person walk out the door, it was three hundred and one thousand dollars over a 13 to 14 month period that the individual had been in the organisation. It was a more senior role, they were on a, a 120k package and so of course the larger you know, the salary the, the more expensive that cost is going to be of having that person walk out the door. Um, so and employers, you know, they really need to understand that whilst um, an individual may come and ask them for an extra five thousand dollars, for example, on top of their salary. Um, you know, they need to really weigh up whether that, you know, if it's a very good employee, it's worth their while to pay that and maintain them rather than have, um, you know, eighty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars walk out the door with them. Um, in lost productivity, in training, in the lost contacts that, that are actual um, value within the organisation and within their company. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, let, let's move on to um, things that you're also very um, passionate about in terms of HR and obviously HR plays a critical effect on uh, companies as well. What critical HR uh, imperatives are important for businesses to grow, uh, especially in this economy? Um, okay, the imperatives around growth within an organisation is really the timing um, and growing uh, at the right pace. Uh, it's it's a tricky one to balance. It really is. Uh, I've seen companies that have grown too fast uh, and they put on staff too quickly and it, and it implodes for them. Uh, and then I've seen the opposite as well, where companies are um, a bit reticent to take the risk, uh, and as a result, they're not growing as fast as they they could be. Um, so how do you, uh, well, how do you know when to do that? Well, it's you know it's all it's all a part of your balancing your, your forecasting as well, and there is that there is that risk around that. Um, it's really important within an organisation for you. For your HR to be planned out, um, I think when I when I think about an analogy around this, it's um, when we think about 
um, in the war and the Australians on the Kokoda Trail. Okay, uh, their advantage and the reason why they were so successful up there uh, was that they they gained the help of the locals. Okay, so they got the the local natives up there to actually clear the way for them to and because they knew the lay of the land. And, and they were able to guide um, our troops through there and, and block the Japanese, right? The Japanese just landed there and just kind of went gung-ho. It didn't really work for them because they weren't that planned about it. So in the same way in an organisation, um, if you're a small organisation growing, you really need to engage the help of, you know, someone who's been there before. Um, who's laid those paths down before and, and can help those organisations avoid those pitfalls uh, so their growth is um, a lot smoother uh, and a lot more paced rather than being haphazard and, and, and all over the place. Um, so, you know, the, the advantage of actually knowing um, when an organisation needs to step up in their level of sophistication around their policies and their strategies and their approaches uh, is, is really important. And it can be sometimes an awkward um, process, particularly when, for example, in, in my area of work with clients, um, you know, when they need to start getting a, a higher level of quality candidate, it becomes quite tricky because the existing staff can go, well, you know, what's wrong with us? We're okay. Uh, you know, we've been doing okay so far, but it's always one of the most difficult conversations I have with executive teams and CEOs when I just say, look, you, you really need to be, you know, shooting for higher level of candidate now. Uh, and that comes with various different, you know, price tags uh, and, you know, things that you need to offer them to attract them uh, to the organisation. Yeah. Uh, uh, Absolutely, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. This is a um, HR is a sophisticated thing and a delicate thing at the same time to handle okay. for a lot of it businesses has, out there. It's become um, more and more sophisticated over the, over the years, and I think um, you know one of the in you know I've got my ebook, the fifteen values managers commit when hiring employees, and you know one of the most critical ones is that they fail to recognise that that uh, you know, recruitment and, and HR has changed, it's become a lot more sophisticated. So you actually have to change with that. So, you know, it's kind of like in the way that, you know, within um, marketing within an organization, when the internet came along, uh, it could not be ignored that they marketing had to become more sophisticated and change around technology and go with technology. It's kind of the same with, with HR, you know, you, it's imperative that organisations change and, and get on board and understand that, yeah, it is a lot more sophisticated, so we, we just need to accept that and understand it, and if we don't understand it, we'll, we'll, we'll engage external help with that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now, Anna Marie, you provide, you're not only a, an author, but you provide a lot of great content on your websites and your blog. I, I, I read a great article about... Uh, about poaching staff and things like that yeah. and the downfalls and I, I thought it was a fabulous article and you've got some great tips there on how to be a more effective management. Uh, tell us more about your book and the, the great resources on your website. Okay, um, <clears throat> well I have a number of ebooks, and the one that you're referring to is, is this one, Poaching Employees with Finesse. And they're accessible on my website. So anyone can go to www.corporatecanary.com.au slash free reports and, and download these. Uh, with poaching, um, don't be squeamish about it, okay? Business is business. I think a lot of people get a little bit squeamish around targeting and poaching competitors' staff. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, don't be squeamish about it. Uh, the other point I raise in it is be sportsmanlike uh, with uh, your competition. So be classy about poaching, and what I mean by that is um, be willing to take uh, a risk to uh, to enjoy the long-term benefit of having this staff member on board. And what I mean by that is when you're going through that dance or that romance of uh, poaching a, a competitor's employee. 
um, timing is actually really crucial. Uh, and you know, once you've got to the stage where you feel that uh, you know you've had enough discussions, with, you know, um, confidential discussions with uh, this individual that you want to bring on board and, and you, you pretty much know that they, they are really keen to join you. Be sportsmanlike and, um, and give your competitor the opportunity to counter offer um, your, your candidate. Uh, just so, you know, because, you know, they can, they can turn around and do the same to you and poach your best staff. Um, so it's also w worth your while to just um, be you know, um, classy about it and, and just say to them, look, uh, this employee has approached us to work with us. Um, we would like to give you the opportunity to counter offer to them if they wish to stay with you. You only do that once you are at that point where you know that the individual is pretty much going to sign on, on, on the line. Um, the other thing is to be really aware of, I've seen many poaching um, exercises go really horribly wrong um, when you know they may be the golden boy or the golden girl in your competitor competitor organization um, but when they come to your organization it, it's you know they're not working out they're not um, you know as great an employee as you thought they were going to be and you kind of both parties are kind of thinking well what's going wrong well it could be for various different factors um, the pace of the, your organisation may be completely different to what they're like, where they've come from. Um, the environment and the culture could be really quite different. So whilst you were great mates and you knew them very, very well from that previous organisation, if the organisation that they're coming to isn't really, really similar um, in culture, they they. And in the politics as well, politics can be very different in organisations. Um, so they might be a great political player in that organisation, but you know, is they're lost to it in the in the new organisation. So, other than just your skills, your experience, and and their track record, be really aware of uh, those other factors around politics, um, culture, and pace of an organisation. I know a. a a, a client who did they they brought a, a sales manager in from an existing um, relationship they knew, uh, and he he just crashed and burned in this new organisation because the pace was completely different and the sales cycle was different. It was a much shorter sales cycle where he came from a background that had a longer sales cycle. So it's looking at all those different factors. Yeah. Great, Anne-Marie, you provided so much great uh, content and uh, information for small businesses or businesses out there to consider when it comes to recruitment and being really strategic and thoughtful about it. Um, just in summary, um, what type of companies out there should be looking for a recruitment strategists like yourself and consultant uh, to guide them through the rocky path of recruitment and uh, who are they and why should they be looking for someone like yourself? Yeah, look, I deal from companies that have five employees to 50 to 500. Uh, so, you know, I think one of the mistakes that smaller organisations um, make is that they think, oh, well, those services or that help is only, you know, for larger organisations. Um, it's not right. It's actually um, the smaller organisations that need it more because they just don't have the bandwidth to, for it to go wrong, you know. Um, it really hurts them a lot more than larger organisations when they, they, get, uh, they get it wrong. So... Yeah, all, all types of organisations that um, are developing their recruitment strategy really, Sean. <laughs> no, that, that's good. And I encourage you to hop on to uh, the website. Uh, Henry, what was that website again where all, all the free resources were? www.corporatecanary.com.au Fantastic, and I there, there are heaps of great uh, reports there and tips for you to ensure that uh, you get it right. And I recommend you download yeah. some of those great books, uh, free yeah. resources. Yeah, Henry. I'm also I'm also offering um, you know your viewers 
the opportunity that if they have a role that they are recruiting for right now, um, you know, a free trial of creating a, a job behavioural job profile for them, um, just so they can see how that works, and that will give them a, a wealth of information uh, on, you know, and it, it provides an interview guide, a reference check guide, so it's like a 19-page report, all complimentary and for free. So contact contact me at Corporate Canary, and um, I'd be happy to help anyone out. Great. Um, look, send me those information. I'll be happy to post that on our social media boards as well and get that information out. And I'd love to share that uh, information. And thank you very much for your time, Marie. Look, it, it's been a wonderful having you on board for our uh, first of four interviews on how to hire and keep the right staff because we all know that staff can make and break a lot of businesses out there. And we want to make yeah. sure that you hire staff that drive you in the right direction. Great. Thank you, Sean. It's been a pleasure. So thank you very much for joining us on our live streaming um, video during September Small Business Month on hiring and keeping staff. We look forward to you joining us on many more shows. We've got three more shows on, during this segment on hiring and keeping the right staff. It's been great to have Anna-Marie here from Corporate Canary HR Consulting and uh, we look forward to seeing you later. Thank you very much. Until later. Bye-bye for now.